Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Melandra Hastick, Program Coordinator at the James Beard Foundation, and I'm so happy to be welcoming everyone to this event. So tonight we are talking about the Know Your Black History series, which is a monthly webinar highlighting black food and beverage businesses. Tonight's webinar, we will be discussing the power of food and how our panelists are addressing food apartheid. Since last March, the James Beard Foundation has been hosting virtual events and industry support webinars to help navigate the challenges of COVID-19, provide resources for the hospitality industry and to better stay connected through difficult times. But before I introduce tonight's panelists, here are some quick housekeeping rules. This webinar is being recorded We'll post a link to the recording on openforgood.com after the program wraps. If you have any questions for the panelists, please write them in using the webinar toolbar. We'll do our best to address a few questions as time allows. If you're having any dif technical difficulties, just message us using the webinar toolbar and we'll do what we can to troubleshoot. My colleague Debbie will be keeping an eye out and we'll be happy to assist. Now on to our wonderful panelists. We have our moderator, uh, Cassandra Rosario, returning again, uh, Food Before Love. We have JBF Leadership Award winner, Leah Penniman, co-director and farm manager of Soul Fire Farms. We have Kurt Evans, co-founder and chef at Everybody Eats Philly. And we also have Stephanie Willis, founder and chef of Everybody Eats Philly. Now, Cassandra, I will pass the mic on to you. Awesome, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to be here. I wanna say thank you to the James Beard Foundation for having all of us and thank you to you guys that are spending the next hour with us. Looking forward to uh, learning your questions and seeing everything that you wanna ask the panelists and just looking forward to learning from these panelists as well. So uh, I typically start my conversations talking about food memories. I'm gonna pause for a second before we go into that really. Um, and as much as I, I want you guys to highlight, you know, what inspired you to be in this work, I recognize that um, it doesn't always feel good, right? Like true work, is, it, it's, a, it's a labor of love a lot of the time. So I wanna just kick off the evening by asking you guys, what is it that keeps you entrenched in this work and keeps you going? So if Leah, if we can start with you and then also talk about your story and, and what inspired you to get started. Well, first I wanna echo the thanks and praise for everyone who put this together. It's really an honor to be here with all of you. I'm Leah, Soulfire Farm. And what got me into the work and what keeps me going, um, I'm gonna actually throw a food memory in there because I, my juices got flowing with that uh, because it relates. So when I was a young person, around five, six years old, I would garden with my grandmother uh, in blessed memory, Grandma Me Brownie Lee McCullough. And she had grown up on a farm in South Carolina, but like so many African-American folks, uh, wasn't able to hold on to that land and that agrarian way of being, but moved to the Boston area where she maintained a backyard garden with strawberries. Uh, she had a crab apple tree and I would help her tend the garden, harvest and make preserves. That's my first memory of growing food. And when I think about that initial awakening that later helped me to become a farmer, I think of grandmummy and I think of those delicious preserves. So I started farming when I was 16. I needed a summer job, that's what there was totally fell in love with the elegant simplicity of planting and harvesting and feeding the community. It's like this beautiful intersection of ecology and social justice. And once I had a bunch of years under my belt working for other people's farms, uh, started Soul Fire Farm and we're dedicated to ending racism in the food system, which is a huge task. Uh, but we go about it by providing a whole lot of food and medicine to community, training up the next generation of farmers and doing advocacy work to make the world more fair for people who grow food and who take care of the earth. And the only thing that keeps me going uh, is it's love. It's love. I still I'm looking out right now on my strawberry patch. So just that through line of, of deep care uh, for plants, for soil and for the communities that are sustained by plants and soil. 
Love that. Thank you for sharing that with us. Stephanie, let's move on to you. What is it that keeps you entrenched in this work and how did you guys get started at Everybody Eats Philly? Sure. Um, first, thanks for having us. This is amazing that we're even in conversation with all of you. <laughs> the dream come true, um, but you know, the love is, is there. Knowing that we're changing lives and helping people and training up the youth and providing healthy meals and resources to neighborhoods that are just forgotten about is really important to myself, um, to Kurt, to everybody that's on our team. And you know why we got started? We started in um, during a time of social unrest in the city of Philadelphia, right after the murder of George Floyd. There was, um, you know, all of us were outraged and hurt and just beaten up and why is this happening all over again? But specifically in Philadelphia, um, there were neighborhoods that were completely decimated. Corner stores, drug stores, grocery stores, all of which in neighborhoods that don't even have access to fresh and healthy food. So um, I reached out to my friends, Kurt being one of them, a few other chefs, and asked how we can help this community. And um, literally a couple days later, we were able to serve around 600 people. Um, we prepared food, we outsourced, we reached out, to lo reached out to local farmers and were able to really make an impact. And we saw that there was a real need for what we were doing and decided to keep the ball rolling. And here we are almost a year later, still doing what we do. Um, and you know, the food connection for me is just like Leah, being on the farm with my grandmother at a young age, preparing food for our family. My grandmother is one of 16, was one of 16. Um, so Thanksgiving at our house was huge. There's, <laughs> I remember waking up early before the sun even came up, going to the farm, picking greens, um, learning how to cook with her, and that kind of transpired into what I am now. And this is what we do. We make sure that everybody eats. Love that little everybody eats segue you do with. <laughs> Kurt, how about yourself? Um, I know Stephanie spoke to you know how the work got started, but what is it that keeps you motivated and keeps you entrenched in this work? Not hearing you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I put that little box away on the side, and I so I'm just gonna leave myself off of mute because I was trying to like be so like you know. Watch it now. Yeah, yeah. So now I'm gonna just keep it off of mute. But uh, um, Steph pretty much summed it up. Pretty much how you know we came together through this. Uh, time of social unrest uh, in the city of Philadelphia, not just the city of Philadelphia, all over the country. And, you know, when we put everybody eats together, you know, we we saw a void as in like, you know, people really, uh, when 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 shop, when, when, when supermarkets got like destroyed, decimated, it was no food supply for people. And we seen that people had no way, to, no way to like, where would our next meal was going to come from. So that's when we all got together and said, you know, we wanted to get together and us, us being chefs, it's like a nurturing quality. And I mean, I want to take that back to like my food memory of uh, I would go like hunting and fishing with my, my father, grandfather and come back home to my grandmother. And she would like help. She would prepare everything, butcher everything, uh, fabricate, break everything down and always like showing me things. And I was always so anxious to take those things and like, oh, this is what I learned. And then like do the same thing, replicate it. And just like want somebody to taste it and be like, yeah, this is good. So I feel as though like as chefs, that's what we do. We want to we want to nurture people. We want to feed people and what everybody eats. Uh, shout out to Malik, uh, Aziza and uh, and Greg. They're not uh, on the call with us, but there are other uh, three uh, fellow chefs that founded us, co-founded with us. Awesome. OK, so, you know, Melanja mentioned food apartheid, right? And words mean things. So can leah can you speak to what does it mean to address food apartheid and how is that different from addressing a food desert and saying okay here's a supermarket food desert's gone now um and putting that in a neighborhood like how how can we address food apartheid and what does that actually mean i'm so glad you asked that because i think we need to back it up for that context so the federal government will call a zip code that doesn't have supermarkets and has low income a food desert. And one of the challenges with that term is that a desert is a natural phenomena. So it implies that having a zip code where 
there is a paucity of fresh, culturally appropriate, healthy, affordable foods and a glut of fast food, you know, corner stores, packaged foods, alcohol is somehow natural when it is not. Um, the reason we have food apartheid neighborhoods is a, is a human created system of segregation that relegates some people to food opulence and others to food scarcity. And there's a whole history that's beyond the scope of this panel, but of trying to understand redlining, uh, housing discrimina discrimination, the ghettoization of black and brown folks, divestment from communities, um, the war on drugs, all of these things are intertwined and it's why your zip code is the leading determiner of your life expectancy and a leading determiner of incarceration rates quality of education, access to fresh foods, and all other determiners of having a, a high quality life. So I think by calling it food apartheid, it can sound harsh, but it's actually empowering because what it tells us is it's a human created problem. So there are solutions. We can't solve a desert, but we can solve apartheid. And I think that uh, it will take some pretty radical solutions. I mean, to undo 500 years of, of you know, racialized trauma is going to mean uh, the end of housing discrimination, it's gonna mean investment in communities, it's gonna mean reparations, it's gonna mean policy changes. And so the programs that we're doing at Soulfire, um, we both try to you know, attack those, those systems change by, by changing policy, um, but also in the meantime, people need to eat. And I love that everybody eats, right? People need to eat. So we are bringing food to the doorsteps of folks who need it in our community at whatever price they can afford down to zero, um, just fresh every week, you know, coming right to their homes because people need to eat right now and can't necessarily wait for the federal government to catch up to what is right for our communities, though we won't let off the pressure for them to do so. Um, I did also want to mention how, you know, in the past, food pantries, even now with like this onset of like food fridges popping up in different neighborhoods, there's still like this stigma around it, right? It's like, oh, food pantries, that's just for poor people. That's where they go. And I think um, at Everybody Eats Philly, you guys have done a great job of like making it a community gathering, making it a community event. Can you guys speak to like how that has played a role in reaching the people that you want to reach and like destigmatizing what it looks like for black and brown people to get access to food in the way that we deserve? Absolutely, just, just what you said, there's a huge stigma um, to uh, accepting anything that's free, especially in the black community. You don't want to look, be looked at as um, being poor, you're from the hood and you can't afford this, Or, but we're coming from a place that you're coming from. We're from the neighborhoods that you're from. We look how you look, we talk how you talk, and we're bringing a sense of camaraderie to you. We're giving you a literal hug uh, during a time where we don't know, a lot of us don't know where our next meal is coming from. We don't know where our next dollar is coming from. We're going into communities where there's immigrants that don't have access to social security or to food stamps or anything. Where are they getting their next meals from? There's children, there's, you know, single mothers. I'm a single mother. There's been times where I don't know, I don't know where where my next meal is coming from. But, you know, just coming from a place of 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 accountability first, knowing that, you know, we come we come from the same neighborhood. We talk like you, we walk like you, we want to bring, we want to be able to cut that stigma all the way out like you need something to eat we got you you don't have money don't worry about it we're you know we're packaging food we're preparing we're chefs for it, so we're preparing meals for you we're locally sourcing as much as we can we're re reaching out to restaurant friends that have a plethora of things that they can't use because restaurants are shut down and making sure that we make it accessible to people that need it for the later half of this conversation we definitely want to highlight like how the community can be involved and support you guys and how can we all come together but i'm really curious to learn how can we sh better share information amongst each other right we think about you know the conferences that are available to us that we may not see ourselves in and there aren't a lot of platforms you know outside of maybe like Black food folks, radical exchange, where we can kind of have that meeting of the minds and be able to share with each other, us doing the work, like how can we support each other and build together? Um, are there any resources that you guys can share or any ways that you guys have kind of tried to co-collaborate? I know Stephanie, you said like, I called on my friends, we got together. So are there other ways like that, that you know we can inspire others to do or ways that are working for you currently? And we can we can start with Leah and then go on to Kurt. Happy to start. Um, ways that we can be connected and are connected. 
I mean, I think that there actually are a lot of connections happening that maybe are under celebrated or happening outside of Twitter or some of the channels that folks might be familiar with. So I want to shout out in this moment, some of our legacy organizations and, and I'll name on more in the farming space than the food space, even though those kind of should be the same spaces, but you know, organizations like the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, which operates all across the Southeast is 53 years old, right? And they have dozens of co-ops, black led co-ops um, that range from farming co-ops to housing to credit unions that have been working together for generations and still they're still rocking together. The Land Loss Prevention Project, um, the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. So that, that type of work is happening. And I, I think it's part you know, it's part of cultural continuation. You know, if you look back to the late 1800s and early 1900s, black folks were organizing cooperatives, partly out of economic necessity because we were excluded from, you know, participating in white businesses and uh, uh, commerce and exchange. And so people form cooperatives um, and some of them had a million members, right? Um, Dubois wrote, wrote an extensive uh, treatise uh, summarizing the work of these cooperatives. So part of it was necessity, but also part of it is culture. Um, the idea of, of individualism, of private property, of competition, isn't as uh, rooted in us um, as black and brown folks because we are still holding on to pre-colonial and indigenous ways of thinking about collaboration. So. So I think it's there, is first first I wanna say, but we can certainly amplify it and there are a number of great tools to do that. Um, if folks aren't on uh, the Growing Food and Justice Listserv, the National Black Food and Justice Alliance Listserv in our region, Northeast Farmers of Color, there's conversations happening, there's get togethers, there's mutual aid, um, and you can definitely reach out to us. Um, we're at Soul Fire Farm, it's in the slide. Um, and we can help connect you if you wanna, if you wanna be in touch with other black and brown farmers who are trying to work towards food sovereignty. Awesome. Kurt, could you add to that at all? Not not really, but <laughs> uh, what I was about to say was um, Black Food Folks Radical Exchange, when you, when you mentioned those, those were two resources I was going to say because I've been a part of both of them like uh, like extensively. So I um, actually sit on the board for Radical Exchange. And um, I think like if you can connect with like, I mean, going to Radical Exchange for, for two years in a row, I met so many uh, black food writers, uh, black chefs. You know, the list just goes on. So you you know met so many people in that network. It it makes it easy to collaborate. Uh, um, and then like you know just use your resources. Uh, we're, we're planning to doing something in uh, Chicago. Uh, Chef Eric Williams, uh, like you know somebody I met, and you know we just we we text. He's like yo, how can I help? So it's like you know your resources around you. You know uh people that you other chefs that you know you know like you said like we said like we're we we are rooted in a lot of collaborative work um so i just think that if you can tap your peers for, say hey this is what i'm doing over what could you do and you know i think that'd be that'd be a good place to start awesome um so i want to stay on the topic of like this community learning and you know it was first at radical exchange that i even learned the importance of farming right i'm a city girl so some of the experiences that you guys are sharing like never experienced for me you know that wasn't my reality so i'm interested in learning like going to this conference i learned about the importance of farming and how few of us um are in the agricultural part of farming and across the nation how the land has really been stolen from us and the importance of us getting back to the land. And I really took an interest, but it's like, where do I start? How do I get involved? And like, there are a lot of resources out there. It could be a little overwhelming. And a lot of the stuff, you know, you mentioned a lot of great resources, Leah. Some of that stuff feels buried to me, you know, and I could be on Google all day and like some of that feels buried to me. So how do you guys now get people involved in some of the work that you're doing? Because I think it's been, both Stephanie and Leah both mentioned like training up the next generation and the importance of that. Do you find that a lot of that has been people coming to you guys saying, hey, I want to be involved. What can I help with? Are you guys also reaching back out to different communities? And if so, how? Um, and how are you like raising this awareness and this interest amongst different communities um, that have different perceptions of what this work actually looks like? Stephanie, we can start with you. Sure, I think that, um, you know, when you think of a chef, 
you don't typically think of a black man or especially not a black woman in a fine dining restaurant or wherever. Um, so, you know, growing up as a child, the first thing you want to be is not a chef. We kind of make it cool again um, to, you know, be in the kitchen and not preparing food for our masters or for, you know, being slaves in, in that sense. We kind of make it cool as, 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 you know, the kids that we work with, especially, um, this is what they want to do. This is what they wanted to do. They grew up the same way with their grandmother in the kitchen or their mother in the kitchen, or, you know, they just have a love for food. So our connection is, is, is the same as, you know, probably any other chef or farmer or what have you, you're training up somebody that wants to be just like you, that admires the work that you do, that, that wants to be in the kitchen. And, you know, it's, it's difficult because when I came up in the restaurant business, there wasn't a lot of front of the house people that were of color. Everybody was in the back of the house washing dishes, prep cook, this, that, and there. And it wasn't like cool to be in the restaurant business. Now it's something that, you know, you see us on TV now, you see us writing books, you see us farming, you see us having these dope organizations that are touching the community. You see us doing the work and it's not just we're doing it for other people. We're doing it because we want to. Great. Leah, would you be able to add to that? Yeah, I just want to resonate with your point about like this information being buried. And I don't I don't think that's an accident <laughs> because there's a way that if if our access to our ancestral knowledge, our access to our food ways, um, our agrarian ways is available to us, we're a lot less easy to control as a people, you know. So these have land and food have long been used used as tools of oppression. Um and and one of the the most powerful and dangerous mythologies is that uh, is that black folks' relationship to land is only circumscribed by oppression, and so we better just run away from that red clay and get to the paved streets of the urban north and never look back. And meanwhile, you look at these uh, investment corporations gleefully buying up black land uh, and m the minerals, the water the soil, the potential for solar panels. I mean, land is a real tangible resource. It's not just a digital number on a bank account that could poof with, with the economy. So um, I think it's really, really important for, for our survival that we, we work together to uncover that knowledge. Um, and I guess what I would say to folks who are, are sort of where to start question, or like it feels intimidating from intimidating to get involved in farming, um, I'll just tell a quick story about my my sister and I when we were traveling to Haiti, which is our maternal homelands, uh, after the earthquake to do some work with farmers there, some recovery work. And uh, we get to where we're staying and she takes out a glass jar and puts some mung bean seeds in it and starts soaking, rinsing them and soaking them. I was like, sis, what are you doing? She said, I'm planting my garden. I'm making sprouts in this jar, mung bean sprouts, because everywhere I go, I need to grow, I need to have something green, I need to grow something. And it made me think, wow, that's the smallest garden I ever saw was this jar, right? And, and you could scale it up to some takeout containers and put some microgreens in it, just whatever old seeds you have, radish and lettuce and scallion, just microgreens, or you could scale it up to some containers. but um, I do think that there is a spiritual healing component when we we take charge of growing our own food, no matter how modest that effort is, that we say we can participate all the way from seed to our bellies in nourishing ourselves. So I always encourage people to start small. Um, and we have all these how-to videos on Soul Fire Farms. So you can like check out our how basic how-to videos and, and build from there. Speaking of seeds, uh, I know that So Far Farm focuses on seeding sovereignty, and we had a question come in from the audience um, from Mary, who said that they live in a moderately conservative, predominantly white suburban area. How can they best fight food sovereignty? That's that's a tough one, but I, do you want me to answer it since it was Soul Fire specific? <laughs> I feel like we can't all say, because food sovereignty, to be clear, is different than just food access. It has to do with democracy in the food system, with everybody having the right to participate in all aspects from land to plate. So that's land redistribution, uh, heirloom creole seeds. It's about water rights. It's about gender justice, um, environmental health, co-ops, you know, ending food apartheid, like that whole arc, that whole everything. 
Um, so how can folks get involved? Well, I will, again, direct you to a resource, go to soulfirefarm.org, take action, and there is a whole guide there. And the reason I'm telling you this is because the food system is complicated and it, you, there's no three easy steps and it's fixed. Otherwise it would be fixed, right? We, there's policy things we need to do. There's things around our sourcing. So if you're part of an institution, you should be signing on to Real Food Challenge, right? Or an equivalent, making sure you have ethical purchasing. You gotta make sure you're fighting for the justice for uh, the Black Farmers Act, the Fairness for Farm Workers Act, right? So there's all kinds of, of things that need to happen. And the reason we put such a long list together is because you need to figure out what's your sphere of influence and your passion and intersect there. But definitely, definitely check that out because we all eat food. We all live on land. We're all responsible, regardless of our ethnicity and class. You know, we all need to definitely take action. This is also my two cents. Uh, but I was on a different panel. We talked about going to the food market and asking the farmers there if they're being treated fairly um you know and just and sometimes the owners of the land are there with them so being able to ask that question and if they're being trained properly those kinds of things i think obviously being here tonight and like getting this education continuing to educate yourself on what's going on and spreading that knowledge with others is a is a beginning as well um so yeah just wanted to encourage that um so you know leah mentioned earlier about policy change and i do want to bring up how you know we think about the black panthers and and the free food program and how now um in the school system you know kids go and and they get breakfast and they get free lunch sometimes um so that has transferred over to long-term change in some sense right still red tape sometimes but there's been some efforts made. So how can we encourage long-term change or really what is it that you guys want to see as far as like your vision personified? Or has there been a moment, you know, in your work thus far that you have seen and you're like, that's exactly what I want to see happen 10 times over? Kurt, we can start with you there. Is has there been any like memory that you're like, this is exactly what I want to see happen in other communities 10 times over for this to continue. Um, and I mean, ultimately, I know that we don't want to have to be doing this kind of work because it shouldn't be a problem in the first place, right? Um, but yeah, just want to highlight that. Kurt, we'll kick it off with you. Yeah, um, I remember I was on a, a panel and we were talking and someone said, you know, you know you can't you can't put like a trader droves like in west philly because he was like you know people can't afford like you know the you can't afford to go to trader joe's and spend money and i was like you know that's a lie i was like you know because you can go to the you can go to the corner bodega and you're actually paying higher price for simple things like you can pay like probably like an extra like 65 more cents on top for green pepper onions um actually um cereal like a single mom she wanted to get cereal from the, the the corner store versus getting it from a supermarket she's paying the market price there so um i, I want to see a lot of people stop putting like certain communities in certain boxes because like uh leah said earlier it's a lot of things just involved in it not just uh, uh a food uh desert like this is this is not a natural occurrence uh you know when you get think back into like housing policy and also a lot more um fair housing acts. There's a lot of uh developers coming into these places, building uh apartment complex, nothing with a uh a right to um home ownership in communities. So you have people coming into communities that are like Philadelphia, like safe Philadelphia. Um we're we're on a level of about to be in a real live tech city soon. I mean, a couple years out. I mean, I was I say we're about like seven, eight years out from being a real live tech city. So now um like urban garden gardening is something that's something that a lot of people are taking to in Philadelphia. And I want to see a lot more gardening, a lot more programs with uh we work with US foods that everybody eats. So US foods comes to our communities, help us connect people with food. Actually, now they're trying to help us connect people with jobs in these communities. So uh, a lot more programs where it's community-based driven uh programs that's based in food food access and uh a more of a investment in communities and the divestment from 
a lot of these things that are taken from communities. Awesome. Stephanie, um, would you mind adding to that um, and also just speaking to uh, long-term change and like any policy changes that you have in mind? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, food should not be political. You should not have to choose between purchasing food and paying a light bill or anything. There, everybody should have access to fresh and healthy food no matter what city you're in. If you're in the hood, if you're in the suburbs, there should not be, you should have access period. Um, and I just think that long term, we, we'll have this conversation again, probably th this conversation will continue. Um, I, I'm not sure if I know what we're doing helps. I know that what everybody is doing helps. Um, but I think it's deeper than just we're, we're it's deeper. <laughs> it's deeper than this. It's deeper than, than what we're doing. We have to physically uh, do more, all of us have to do more to make sure that people have access to fresh and healthy food. And then on top of that, knowing what to do with it. A lot of times when we go into communities with these uh, produce boxes or grocery boxes that we're getting from the government and handing them out, they're full of um, you know, dried beans or vegetables that people haven't seen before. Um, so we take it upon ourselves, like I'll take a box home, I'll break it down, I'll do a cooking class on what to do with you know, what's in here. But there's a lot that needs to be done. And I know that we're going in the right direction. Um, I just hope that we're able to sustain and make sure that um, you know we continue to do what we need to do to make sure that people have access to free and healthy food. Awesome. Leah, has there been a memory of yours of like where you've seen kind of your vision personified and you're like, I want to see this happen 10 times over? And has that related to any of the policy change that you want to see or that you are currently working towards? Absolutely. I mean, I, I we certainly have a long way to go, but I believe in celebrating our victories and milestones because we may never, you know, we might get to the mountaintop and not the promised land. And so we need to celebrate. So one of them that's more intimate and personal would be, um, and it's anecdotal, but just over the 10 years that Soul Fire Farm has been in operation and has been doing trainings for rising generation farmers, it's been profound to see the landscape transform. I mean, 10 years ago in the circles that we walked in, we were the only rural black led training space outside of the South. And like people came from all over the country to come join. I mean, they still do. So that's been really, really powerful. But um, to see our alumni, our comrades, like build, excuse me. <laughs> Just like building out new farm spaces and <clears throat> you're all good. And while you take a second, if you guys have any more questions from the audience, like feel free to drop them um, in, in the chat or as a question so that we can get them answered this evening. I'll give it back to Leah now. So I, was, I was just saying like, there are so many farms that have been popping up that are led by our folks and that's been really powerful. And something that struck me on the more policy level is the work on the Justice for Black Farmers Act. It is such a radical piece of legislation. It involves massive land reform of millions of acres. It involves creating a farm conservation core for black farmers. It involves debt forgiveness and to have you know, senators talking about this, introducing legislation to have pieces of it introduced into the COVID relief bill and passed, it's like beyond my wildest imagining. So we're doing it, like we're on the right path. Uh, I wanna say on this topic of the land itself and like that changing, um, we had a question come in from the audience uh, from Scott who asks, how do we support and fund land acquisition for BIPOC communities? Um, he also mentioned like just land reparations. He's been able to own uh, acres of land in the past, but he mentioned so the difficulties of acquiring land and, you know, as you guys know, everything that the obstacles and it being stacked against us trying to acquire land. Um, Leah, could you also just address like what does support and funding look like for land acquisition for BIPOC communities? Sure. So again, you know, um, land access is really a crisis in, in this country. Um, 
95% of the arable acres are white owned by, yeah, by area and 98% of the acres are white owned by value. So there's almost no land for BIPOC communities at all. And this of course is a result of a whole legacy of USDA discrimination of, of lynching and violent expulsion of people from their lands of heirs property exploitation. So there's a lot there. And again, it's gonna take um, massive policy change, things like the Justice for Black Farmers Act to start to get at that. Um, and in the meantime, and, and parallel, you know, we're developing our own institutions, namely land trusts, um, and shout out to Shirley Sherrod and the New Communities Land Trust, which was the first uh, land trust in the U.S. It's black owned, black run. But a land trust is a, a community controlled vehicle that can put land into protection for a cultural and environmental use permanently. And uh, a couple that I, I wanna name include the Agrarian Commons, that's on a national scale, as well as the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. And so those getting in touch with those organizations can be a good way to be matched up to affordable land for folks who are interested in being accountable to a community and, and keeping that land um, used according to a mission. Uh, aside from land trusts, you know, the USDA does have some capital you know pro loan programs but i gotta put a big asterisk there that the federal government does not have a good track record with honoring our communities and um can has actually been an agent of oppression so always make sure that you have somebody a navigator working with you if you're going to try to access those federal resources to make sure it doesn't put you in a compromised position thank you um want to continue to just talk about programming and what people can expect from you guys and how people can start to get involved. Stephanie, if you could just speak to some of the events that you guys have had in the past and what you guys have coming up that the communities can be a part of. For sure. I mean, summertime for us, um, obviously we started last summer. It's, it's a cookout vibe. It's a party every time. We, we're not just coming and handing out government boxes to people. Uh, we source our own produce, we put together produce bags for families, we're preparing meals individually, collectively, we're reaching out to our restaurant friends that, um, you know, have more access to, we don't have a kitchen space, so we're literally in somebody's kitchen, cooking at home, purchasing a grill, cooking on, on the sidewalk to make sure that, you know, we can provide a sense of camaraderie to these communities. Um, while giving them food as well, we're taking, like I said, we're taking away the stigma completely that receiving help is, you know, has to be a bad thing. Everybody needs a little help sometimes. Um, so for us, we, Juneteenth is a huge event for us. Last year we did two locations for Juneteenth, one in North Philadelphia and one in West Philadelphia. Um, and, you know, we served up an amazing menu by our talented chefs. And then we also still did um, produce boxes. We did toiletries, uh, necessities for children formula, and this is what happens at each and every one of our activations. Um, so Juneteenth is going to be huge for us. We actually just signed a lease on our first space, um, so we'll be moving in July 1st. Um, I think July 10th is going to be our launch, so we'll be doing almost like a basketball team. We'll do home and away games. So the community that we're living in um, is in Kensington, which is drug-ridden, and it's awful, but we're, we we did have an event there. and. Um, we saw a need and it was wonderful just to bring people together and know that you know the stuff that we brought was needed uh really really needed so um like i said throughout the summer every activation is, is a vibe it's a cookout we bring a dj we bring a grill we're providing you with what you need necessities we're learning um about your community and how we can help we're bringing in local community leaders um i know a big event for me we we helped uh fuel the vote literally we made sure that we were at the polls feeding people uh, we had a huge drive-by event because this is still covid uh, where people can come get registered to vote um learn about you know things that we have going on so throughout the summer we do have activations every other week um in different neighborhoods as well as the neighborhood that we're moving into and you can find all of the information it hasn't been uploaded yet but you can find the information when it's available on our website everybodyeatsphilly.org um, you can follow us on Instagram at Everybody Eats Philly, Twitter, the same thing. Um, but we do have a lot of cool things coming up. And, and I think it's Oh, go ahead, Court. Kurt. If you wanted to add. Okay. <laughs> All right. I was just going to add that um, 
I think it's important, like how you mentioned, like fueling the vote, like how all these issues are so connected, right? And you mentioned like food not being, it does, it shouldn't be political, but it so much of it is, right? And so many of the issues that um, we face as Black people, like, are so intertwined. It's like okay, we want to solve this, but this over here has to be solved first. So I just think it's really important, you know, for those watching to think about that um, as we're doing this work, as we're supporting this work um, and looking out for, you know, what's the next thing that we need to quote unquote tackle. Like all of these things is really a domino effect. Um, and it's just about like putting one foot in front of the other and doing what you can, you know, within your own day-to-day -day life. Um, Leah, can we just add on with you uh, just programming and, and you know, what might be coming up this summer or programming that people can be a part of to get involved with Soul Fire Farms? Well, we would love to have folks get involved. Uh, we're a little off the beaten path. We're way upstate New York, about three and a half hours north of New York City in a tiny mountain town called Grafton. And we have volunteer days uh, twice a month, so folks can sign up for those. We have a monthly tour that has a virtual option as well as an in-person option. Uh, for BIPOC aspiring growers, we have an online webinar and video series called 3D Digital Deep Dive. So you can learn your mushroom cultivation, how to build a cold frame, how to manage a greenhouse, all, all types of things like that. Um, and then we do um, have a few slots open for remote volunteers. So people who like to do research projects or data projects, um, we can sometimes hook you up with something. So um, again, head to soulfirefarms.org, uh, take a look at the program calendar. There's something for everyone and we would really love to build community with you all. Awesome. Um, I'm about to get into the questions. Uh, before I do though, I just wanna say congratulations to each of you for everything that you're building. Like I'm always so proud to be on these panels and see people that look like me doing this work. Um, and so effortlessly, I know that it takes hard work and you guys make it look easier than it actually is, but just wanted to say thank you uh, and congratulations on everything that you guys have built thus far and will continue to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. So I want to um, get some of those questions out from the audience. Uh, we had someone ask about the Southern Eastern Farming Co-op. If we could just repeat the name for that, that came in from Aaron. Was that the full name, Southern That's Eastern? That might mean the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. Okay. Uh, which is a 53-year-old cooperative organization in the Southeast. Um, yeah, check check them out. Um, Mr. Cornelius Blanding is the executive director and they have a lot of outstanding programs. Uh, Leah, do you know about the a program? Um, I met the guy, I'm, I'm, I'm mad because I'm drawing a blank, but uh, we met him at Radical Exchange and he was talking about the, uh, that that they were giving like uh, as a Southern uh, farming uh, cooperative um, and they're giving out uh, internships for people to come work and then you can uh, product, pro uh, finally like own some farmland but uh, I wanted to know if you knew anything about that I'm not sure about that particular program um, I feel like we probably know each other because it's a small community but you're making me think about we are collaborating with the Federation on this program called the Bra Braiding Seeds Fellowship and applications just closed. So you keep it in mind for next year, but it does provide rising generation farmers with money, mentorship, professional development, land finding services, like all the things you need to get started on your farm. And we'll work with a cohort of 10 and um, 10 a year for five years. So. That's that's in collaboration with the Federation. I'm not sure which internship you're talking about, but um, if I if I figure it out, I'll, I'll throw it up on our website. So folks, if they go there, we'll see. Um, speaking of like cohort and thinking about the time commitment that that what that looks like, uh, we had a question come in from Halsey about, you know, they have a, a day job. So what does that look like them aspiring to be a farmer, but also working potentially nine to five. We don't know if it's remote now with the things changing with COVID. So do you recommend like they have to go all in? Can they do a part-time thing? Like what have you seen be successful? 
I feel like you got to get into it. Like It's a job like any job, right? So how much time you give it is what you're going to get out of it. If you want to garden, you can garden two days a week after work. That's fine. If you want to farm as your career, it's a career, you know, but the first thing to do, of course, is to learn the skills. Just like if you want to be a doctor, you don't just walk into a hospital and pick up a scalpel, you know, you got to train. So for folks interested in farming, uh, you know, you can, you can start with gardening, find a mentor, you can um, get a job on a farm, work a couple seasons, and and then you know if it's for you, and you know sort of what scale that you would be excited about um, about developing for yourself. And then we had another question come in from Ashley about distilleries and brewing, and if you guys have had any experience either ingredient sourcing or working with community engagement, just collaborating with breweries or distilleries in your work. Sound familiar? Not really, not yet. Kurt, it seemed like you wanted. No, um, well, uh, I own a, a pizza shop too in Philadelphia, uh, Downward Pizza. Uh, our mission is uh, we exclusively hire people that's been formerly incarcerated. Uh, we give out uh, six months, uh, uh, six months rent free living uh, on the uh, perimeter upstairs. And um, we're actually going to start doing some collaboration with uh, breweries, as far as in like you know pop ups with pizza and breweries, but. Um, uh, breweries are, are about to become a real good uh, lifeline to the restaurant industry as far as in restaurants because uh, they don't actually uh, they don't actually a lot of them don't actually have food programs so um, they're they're going to need to be able to have other things to be able to sell their like their 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 beer so um, I know a lot of people are like teaming up with breweries doing farmers markets things like that uh, chefs are doing pop up so it's about to be a really good time for breweries and uh in the chef industry and actually the first brewery brewery we're going to be collaborating is called two local brewery and they're black uh they're black owned brewery in philly and um um the next collaboration is going to be with harlem uh hops uh brewery that's black owned too love harlem hops cool all right, so we don't have any more questions, so I'm going to close it out now. Uh, but did you guys have anything that you wanted to add or wanted to let the attendees know before we close out completely? Okay, I'm getting an I'm getting a no. <laughs> uh, I just say, but, like okay. to Kurt and Stephanie, that I mad respect. Like, your work is brilliant. It's beautiful. I love how you provide dignity and joy um, to folks in your community while while also making sure that nourishment is available. And um, I just, I'll pray for y'all. I like wish you the best. Um, it, it's really an honor to be on this panel with you both. Thank you. Likewise, I gained a wealth of knowledge just listening to you speak about farming. It's amazing. I'm, I want to be a farmer now, I think. So <laughs> really, really dope. <laughs> you might hold you to that. So no, no, really, yeah. no. We we, we want to do stuff like that. Uh, a lot of um, we've been we've been like you know a lot of agricultural grants have been coming through like through everybody eats. So um, I think it's just a time for like if if we don't do it ourselves, um, um, we're actually um I meant to say something early. Piggyback off of stuff said. Um, uh, I'm also an organizer with a, a group called Two and Five People's Alliance. And uh, we do a lot of, uh, we want to start doing a lot more uh, uh, neighborhood building. And uh, we want to start using the Everybody Eats events as that network to be able to do that. So what, at, every, at 215 People's Alliance, we actually have a, 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 um, a garden that we have in partnership with a church. So um, we want to actually start doing more community building to get community gardens into certain neighborhoods in the city of North Philadelphia. So that's something that we're, we're looking to go down that partnership with. So we'll have a lot of questions for you, Leah. <laughs> I'll watch all the videos and make sure that we got this gardening thing down pat because I need my strawberries and my cutlets for my grandma. <laughs> this sounds so exciting. I'm looking forward to all of you guys connecting further. Um, I know uh, James Beard Foundation put in the chat how you guys can get connected with them and support their work. So please, you know, when this is over, be sure to follow them, be sure to visit their website, share it with a friend um, so that we can continue this and really, um, you know, continue to build community and solve this issue. 
thank you guys so much for being here tonight. I'm so pleased to be on here with you guys. So thank you again. I'm going to hand it over to Melandra to close us out. And thank you again. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for having us. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. <sighs> this was amazing. So, so amazing. Uh, I learned so much. I'm so glad that every single one of you um, are on this panel. I really hope that our audience learned a lot. And please visit their websites because these people are just amazing. They need your support. Um, and also like behalf of, be, on behalf of the James Spirit Foundation, we would like to thank each and every one of you. Please come again. <laughs> um, and we would like to thank our wonderful audience for tuning in um, with us for another Know Your Black History. And if you could please learn more at openforgood.com slash at the Beard Foundation. Um, we are also, um, raising funds for the Black and Indigenous American uh, Investment Fund right now. So if you can, please go to jamesbeard.org slash investment dash fund or jbffund.org. And everyone, thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you, you too. Thank you, take care. Bye, thank you. How do I end this?